Good morning, welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 7th of May and this quick look at the week ahead beginning the 10th of May. And this week's market events have been a little bit um, bipolar in nature, if you like. We got off to a bit of a rocky start at the beginning of the week, a um, bit, bit of a technical sell-off in the DAX and the NASDAQ. Um, whether that was as a result of um, some negative inputs, concerns, about higher prices, concerns about tapering. I'm not sure we'll ever know because while we saw the big sell-off on Tuesday, um, that was quickly reversed on the Wednesday. And I think large part of the reason for the sell-off on Tuesday was probably more technical than anything fundamentally changing in terms of the economic outlook. If we look at the narratives that are in play at the moment, they still remain broadly positive. Earnings are coming in pretty much in line or better than expectations. We've got commodity prices still looking fairly solid. And even though we saw a big sell-off in the NASDAQ and the DAX in the early part of this week, um, the Dow Jones maintained its resilience. Now, obviously, there are um, mixed feelings about how relevant the Dow Jones is. Fact of the matter is, if you're looking at Dow theory in the way that I do, in terms of averages needing to confirm each other or indices needing to confirm each other, you're not going to get a sustained stock market sell off if only one or two indices are selling off and the others are not. And one of the key takeaways that I took from this week was the fact that even though we saw this technical sell off in the DAX through the 15,000 level, it was reversed very, very quickly. There's Tuesday's price action, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So we've quickly, we've, we've, we've quickly wiped out those losses that we saw on Tuesday. Um, and I think a large part of the reason for Tuesday's sell-off, while you could argue it was technical in nature, was um, a little bit of a faux pas, if you like, from Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen when she um, appeared to put her old Fed chair hat on when saying that rates might have to rise to prevent an overheating US economy. Now, obviously, that didn't help the overall mood, but the market move was already well underway when she said that. And while she subsequently walked them back, she was merely stating the obvious. It is a statement of the bleeding obvious to say that interest rates might rise to prevent a possible overheating of the US economy. And while we did see a little bit of a break lower in terms of the German DAX, what was particularly important was that we held above the 50-day moving average and we're still above this broader uptrend line from the lows that we saw back in the early part of this year in mid-January. Similar sort of move that we saw in the NASDAQ here as well. Decent support all the way through 13,700, which was the previous week's lows. You would expect to see a technical sell off as stops get triggered on a move lower there. But what we didn't see was a break of the 50 day moving average. And what was important about these two technical breaks was that, in the broader scheme of things, if we look at the SP 500, you would expect to see a similar confirmatory break on the S&P. We did not see that. Uh, 41.20. And that's the key support level for me on the S&P 500. Until such times as we get a, at a break of that particular support level, I was very suspicious of the break levels that we saw in the DAX and the NASDAQ. And as it turns out, it was right to be. Also, what was significant was the fact that we were, we we weren't able to close anywhere near the low point of that week. And that even of itself suggests that downward momentum was likely to be limited. And that's even more that's even more relevant, for example, if you look at the FTSE 100, where we, we, we ran out of steam at around about the 70-40 level. And that was a very, very key resistance level. But now we're above that. The road is clear now, I think, for the FTSE 100 to head towards 
7,200 there or thereabouts. Now, why am I picking out that particular level? Well, simply because it coincides with this low here on the 30th of January 2020. So that prompted to be that prompted a little bit of a rebound. It's likely to see um, some form of resistance now that we've broken through the 7040 level. Why is it important? Well, it's important on the basis that we saw it act as support here, 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 here. So it's a very, very important level in the overall scheme of things. The fact that we've been able to push above it and the FTSE 250 is also looking fairly positive should augur well, all things being equal, for a move higher in the FTSE 100 towards 7,230 now that we've broken above 7040. So as we look ahead to next week, um, stock markets broadly still remain fairly well supported, very well um, tilted towards buying on dips. Ignoring all the noise about um, concerns about asset bubbles, we had Lael Brainerd um, speaking um, on Thursday evening, talking about potential concerns that the very easy nature of monetary policy and obviously fiscal policy as well was likely to feed asset bubbles in certain areas. But for me, I think the real driver behind this market move higher is commodity prices, and they still remain fairly well supported. We only have to look at where copper currently is. It continues to move higher. And if you're pushing a renewables narrative, then ultimately anything with a chip board or a circuit board or anything that runs with a battery needs copper. It needs platinum, it needs palladium, it, le it needs raw materials. So where does that leave us? Well, while copper prices continue to move higher, we're really looking back to the levels that we saw all the way back in 2011. And we're already above that. So we've now hit record highs on copper prices over the course of the past week. If we look at a monthly or a weekly chart, we, we can see copper is going parabolic. And that really, I think, is predicated on the basis that those Chinese trade numbers that we saw this morning were very, very positive, certainly in the overall scheme of things. And the likelihood is copper demand is likely to remain fairly strong for quite some time. Now, that's not to say that we won't see pullbacks. We probably will. The big question is, where do those pullbacks come in? I mean, for, as, for, for the last 12 to 24 months, we've seen copper prices more than double. They've gone from $2 all the way up above $4, and now look as if they're heading to $4.80, um, 480 cents. And given, given that narrative, it's hard to see where copper prices can, can really stop. Having broken above those previous highs from February, all the way back in 440. The trend is your friend, ultimately. So we really should be looking to buy dips on copper. Crude oil prices are also looking fairly solid. But again, they're running into a natural barrier on a technical basis all the way back um, around about $72.50, which coincides with these series of peaks all the way through here. So even though um, we're getting a whole raft of predictions that copper prices are going to go up to $75, $80 a barrel. I'm not calling for that because there is big technical resistance around about $72.50. I will only start to put my bullish hat on if we move above that, that series of key resistance levels there so that we can retarget those levels that we saw back in 2018. But, and the thing is, you, you've really got to think, look at, look at oil prices in the round. What OPEC plus doesn't want to do in the overall scheme of things is choke off demand because prices are too high. We're already getting concerns about rising inflationary pressure, rising price inflation. And that's one narrative that I think we'll be paying particular attention to next week when we look at the latest US CPI numbers, which are due out 
on the 12th of May. Um, we've also got UK first quarter GDP, the first print of that coming out on the 12th of May. In fact, most of the data that we've got coming out over the course of the next few days is coalescing around two very important dates, mainly the 12th, 13th and 14th of May. Monday and Tuesday is a little bit light on the data side of things, but as we approach Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, we should see um, uh, some significant input drivers when it comes to where the markets are likely to go. Ultimately, I don't expect any of it to undermine the bullish narrative that has been prevalent over the course of the past few days. Nonetheless, if we look at today's payrolls numbers, which obviously I don't have sight of at the moment, but if they come in anywhere close to expectations, that will shift the focus away from the employment um, mandate of the Federal Reserve, which they are very much targeting. And I'll be paying particular attention to the participation rate, given recent comments from various Fed officials over the course of the past few days. It's the participation rate that I think Fed officials are now specifically looking at um, with respect to um, the, the US labor market rather than the headline payrolls number, which is expected to come in around 1 million jobs for April. Um, Jay Powell has already indicated that he wants to see several months of jobs growth in and around that number given the fact that 8 million Americans still remain out of a job relative to this time, uh, well, not necessarily this time last year, but 14 months ago, February last year. It's important to remember that the participation rate over a year ago was 63.4%, it's now 61.5%. So it's almost 2% lower. So yeah, I think when, when we're thinking about tapering asset purchases, or any alteration of monetary policy towards the hawkish side, that's where we need to focus our attention. A um, similar sort of thing came from the Bank of England this week um, with respect to a modest tapering of asset purchases. And again, it's a similar sort of narrative. It's dialing back on the stimulus as the economy continues to recover. And that probably helps explain why US 10-year yields are lower now than they were a month ago when the March payrolls number came out, the Federal Reserve has done a fairly decent job, despite the fact that jobs growth remains very, very strong, of steering the narrative away from the potential for rate hikes or a tightening of monetary policy in the next six to 12 months. They may struggle to maintain that narrative if we continue on the path of a million jobs plus on a month on month basis by the end of Q2. But nonetheless, we are finding decent support around about 1.5%. So it'll be interesting to see how they're able to maintain that narrative in the face of a rising participation rate and a declining unemployment rate. For the here and now, the focus will be on the UK economy um, in the wake of recent political developments when it comes to um, Scottish and Welsh elections and obviously the recent win of the Conservative Party in the Hartlepool by-election where the uh, Labour candidate was pretty much obliterated um, with um, the, the Conservatives getting over 50% of the vote. Not too sure about the turnout, but nonetheless, it's still a significant development. And certainly in the overall scheme of things, we'll get a good indication of how well the UK economy um, is doing as it comes to the end of the first quarter in terms of first quarter GDP and the performance of the pound which has lagged a little bit uh, this week um, relative to its peers. It's not had a particularly great week, still in a bit of a range, but nonetheless still below that 140.20 area, which, is I'm, which I'm targeting as a potential breakout point for a move higher. Seen a little bit of softness in and around, um, which has been supported by around about the 138 area. And I think we can really sort of define our range by the lows around about 138 and the potential for a move higher. 
Um, the Bank of England upgraded its growth forecasts for 2021 to 7.5% from 5%. That should be broadly supportive of the pound, assuming um, no unexpected surprises. People are suggesting that the SNP getting a majority in Scotland could undermine the pound. While that may seem, that while, while that may seem plausible, to be quite honest, I just can't buy into it because ultimately the, SM, the SNP's raison d'etre is for an independence referendum. Asking for one and getting one are two totally different things. And I still think we remain a long way short of them getting their wish for an independence referendum. And it does appear on the basis of recent opinion polls is that um, the desire for independence has slipped back a little bit from the levels that we saw at the beginning of this year. In terms of the narrative, in terms of the economic data, that is likely to continue to improve. The UK economy is expected to show a modest contraction of 1.7% in the first quarter, but that's not, you know, that's not going to be a surprise to most people. What's going to be a particular interest will be the monthly GDP numbers for March in particular. And here we're expecting to see an expansion of 1.3% as a result of restocking um, of inventories ahead of the reopening that we've seen and the improvement that we've seen in April and likely to continue to see into May. Manufacturing production for March is, is expected to also see a modest improvement of a rise of 1.5% in manufacturing production and a 1.2% rise in industrial production. What's particularly important was in April, we saw all PMIs for construction, manufacturing and services come in above 60, a trifecta of 60s for PMIs in the UK economy. When was the last time we saw that? It was a very, very long time ago. And it does augur well, despite the fact they are diffusion indexes, it does augur well for the outlook going forward and a much better Q2 than we've seen in Q1. So the overall narrative for the pound hasn't changed. If we draw a trend line through the lows here, we can see that the dips are getting shallower. The dips are getting shallower. That suggests that the pound is building up for a potential move higher. The only thing that would undermine that is for a move below those two support lines, those various support lines, that I've drawn in on the chart there. Euro sterling still remains very much capped around about 87.30. And that remains the overall narrative here as well. Um, decent support around about 85.80, as well as the 50 day moving average. This is very much a range trade, but I'm still of the opinion that sterling needs to be bought on dips. We've also got US retail sales. And one of, the, one of the things that's puzzled me a little bit has been why the dollar has remained so weak. And we, you know, nothing bears that out better than um, the CMC dollar index. But what's important here is that we haven't taken out the lows of earlier this year. And the only reason the dollar is weak is because of increased expectations of an economic recovery in the UK, which is obviously benefiting the pound, but also an expectation that the economic picture in Europe is likely to improve as the vaccination get as the vaccination rollout gathers pace. The problem with that narrative is that Europe still remains very much behind the UK and the US in its vaccination programs, and they're trying to open up at a time when infection rates are still quite high unlike the UK and the US, which still haven't fully opened up, and infection rates are much, much lower. So there's a much higher risk premium for Europe opening up and trying to get some form of summer season at a time when infection rates are still much higher than they are in the UK and the US. And that's before we even consider events that are going on in Asia, India particularly, specifically, with respect to infection rates there rising and the risk that actually those variants that we're seeing in India could actually ripple out into other areas of Southeast Asia. 
and that is a real big concern at the moment. Turkey is also locked down, um, and that is a concern because it suggests that Southeast Asian countries are finding it much more difficult to rein in the growth of infection. So brings us on now to the narrative when it comes to the US dollar. We've got US retail sales and US CPI, and these two numbers could actually impact what happens with respect to US bond yields, specifically US CPI. US CPI is due out on the Wednesday, and the recent sharp rises in the inflation numbers here have raised concerns in recent weeks that the Federal Reserve might be inclined to tap the brakes when it comes to current levels of monetary stimulus. Now, not overly concerned about that. And I think while we expect to see a big rise in US CPI, um, we've come from 1.4% in January to 26 in March. We're expected to see a rise to 3.6% in April. Um, which would be a big, big jump. But you've also got to put that in the in the context of what inflation was doing a year ago. It's 3.6% higher from April last year when the US was still in partial lockdown and there was a significant deflationary bias to prices then. Now, oil prices also um, were coming off a very, very low base a year ago. And look at where they are now. So while we could get a big, big spike in inflation pressures in April in US CPI to 3.6%, they're likely to be, and I hate to use that word, and I need to take a drink, transitory. Um, so the big question is, is not whether or not they come in at 3.6% in April, they will come in an awful lot higher, is whether or not that sort of level is sustained into May, June and July. And I think that's why central bankers have been banging the transitory drum, because of the base effects that we saw as a result of the commodity price crash 12 to 13 months ago. They need to wash out of the numbers, and once they do, we'll get a good idea of where inflation levels are. But certainly if you look at commodity prices now in terms of it's not just oil prices that are bouncing back, you're seeing commodity prices bounce back across the board. And that's why we're seeing a little bit of nervousness around about the inflation outlook going forward. Bond markets appear fairly sanguine about them at the moment. You can see that you've seen the two the US 10 year yield. But if if you start to see that start to edge higher or shorter term yields start to edge higher then we may start to be a little bit concerned. We've also got US retail sales for April, and we saw a big rise in March of 9.7%. The April numbers aren't likely to be anywhere near as robust, but we're still expecting to see a rise of around about 1.1, 1 1.3, 1.4% for April as the as those as those those stimulus checks that we saw rolled out in March continue to get spent in April and may particularly since the particularly since us theme parks reopened in april so you could get a boost from that um, on the back of the partial reopening of the theme parks of the likes of disney and what have you in the re, the us retail sales numbers for april okay so that that really sort of rounds up the data that we, we were looking at over the course of the next um, few days. Um, so certainly in the context of euro dollar, we are continuing to find life difficult anywhere near 121. Um, we saw that at the end of April come back down. We've since rebounded. We're now st striving to push back up above those sorts of areas. And there is a risk that if we do get further dollar weakness, um, that we could see euro dollar push higher, but I'm still struggling with the idea that the euro is likely to gain against the dollar. But we'll see. But at the moment, I'm still of the opinion that we're very much sell the rally mode. We haven't really significantly broken above um, this downtrend line here. Yeah, it's a little bit messy, um, and I'm probably may need to redraw it a little bit. But ultimately. 
I think while we're below the highs that we saw here around about 120, 150, it's going to find it very, very difficult to push significantly higher given the barriers that we got at 122 here. Decent support around about 119.80. I think if Euro does go up, it's largely going to be as a result of dollar weakness than any, any significant Euro strength. If we look at the CMC Euro index here, I'll just get rid of that there, pop that in there. We can see that the 200 day moving average um, we've seen a little bit of a rebound here, but we still remain very well. We, we, we still remain some way short of the peaks that we saw at the end of April, um, certainly on the euro index that we currently have here. OK, so that brings us on to a fairly decent earnings week. Thus far, we've seen fairly decent. We've seen, we've seen fairly decent numbers when it comes to the the earnings picture and the ones that I'm going to pay particular attention to um, are BT Group. Um, we've seen some fairly decent gains over the course of the past few days. Um, BT's done a fairly decent job of contending with the competing demands of a tough market, market in broadband, mobile hitting its margins in its consumer division, enterprise and global divisions having to cope with rapidly changing business environments. It's also competing with Sky for eyeballs with its huge investment in BT Sport and where the latest Premier League rights are coming up for renegotiation. Obviously, OpenReach has the chance to benefit from the rollout of its high-speed broadband um, that the UK needs, but only if it's kept under the BT umbrella, posting a little bit of a bearish reversal here. It's also got a boost from recent um, speculation that it's going to sell its BT Sport division. And I think that is something that it does really need to do. It can't really compete with Sky. There's no guarantee that it'll be able to get the sort of price that it got for the last set of Premier League rights, given the recent Super League shambles. Um, certainly, I think my appetite for Premier League football has certainly taken a hit. The fact that we can't watch Champions League football or Europa League football without having a BT subscription has put me off even purchasing it, given the fact that you need Sky and Amazon to watch Premier League. Why would you pay extra for Champions League? So I think given BT's other obligations in terms of 5G, 5G and broadband upgrades, they don't have the resources to compete with the likes of Sky, Disney and all the other entrants to the market in terms of football and sport um, like Amazon. So if they can sh they, if they can move BT Sport off the balance sheet, that's going to give them much more money to invest in 5G and broadband, which is probably where they're strongest. Um, so it's full year numbers are likely to reflect that. And I'll be looking for particular detail on their plans to spin off BT Sport to try and invest money where it is needed in terms of 5G and high-speed broadband. But it does look in the short to medium term as if we may have seen a short-term top in the BT share price as we look ahead to their four-year numbers, which are due out on the 13th. We've also got Rolls-Royce. Now, Rolls-Royce shares, um, I mean, there's no question Rolls-Royce is facing a huge number of challenges. It was facing challenges even before the pandemic because of the because of the um, problems around its Trent 1000 engines. Now, this I think this this week's first quarter update is unlikely to show much of an improvement in terms of its civil area, aerospace division. British Airways IAG recorded another one billion euro loss in its first quarter as flying hours remained fairly subdued. We should see an improvement in the second quarter. Um, certainly the, the company, Rolls-Royce, has managed to raise an extra nine billion pounds of extra liquidity, and that should allow it to ride out the current um, problems that it faces with, in terms of low flying hours. I think there will be an improvement in Q2. I think the domestic carriers will be probably more in favor in terms of Ryanair and EasyJet, when it comes to flying hours. International travel could take a while longer, but it does appear to be finding a fairly decent area of support in and around 90 to 100 pence. And as long as it can hold on to those lows, 
then the prospects look good for a move back above 120. But at the moment, I think we need to keep our expectations low in terms of what it can offer us in terms of its first quarter numbers. And again, they are also due out on the 13th of May. We've also got other notable numbers that are due out, Coinbase, Airbnb, and Walt Disney. And let's look at Coinbase because Coinbase, I mean, that does not look a particularly positive um, IPO. Yes, it came out at an indicative price of $250. It opened at $380 and has gone pretty much one way back since then. It's now back close to its indicative price. I think the big question is with respect to its last quarterly update is whether or not it was able to match the revenues that it saw in Q1. Q1. Now, Coinbase expects to make around about $730 to $800 million in this quarter. Um, it's got 65, 65, 56 million verified users, and its latest results showed the company turned over $1.8 billion in the first three months of its fiscal year. Well, obviously that's more than the that's more than the company generated the whole of 2020. So in terms of trading volumes, the last quarter turned over $335 billion. Um, I think the big question is, can it sustain the targets that it was projecting for its user base over the course of the rest of the year? The company outlined three separate scenarios for the year. The most optimistic was around 7 million monthly users, which is slightly higher than its current 6.1 million monthly transacting users. Cryptocurrencies are continuing to look fairly well supported, and yet Coinbase has gone pretty much one way. Will this week's first quarter numbers signal a base in terms of the recent declines in its share price? $250 is significant because that was its direct listing indicative price. Can it hold above there? We've also got numbers for Airbnb. I think the big question for me with respect to Airbnb is not whether or not it can actually turn a profit this particular quarter, but is it worth $94 billion? Because that's that share price there um, to, is essentially um, telling us that it is worth. 94 billion dollars revenues in q4 fell 22 percent to 859 million dollars now expectations for this first quarter are for revenues of 712 million dollars which is lower than q4 and a loss of about 130 million so the big question for me is will revenues return to the levels they were in 2019. Revenues in 2019 were $4.8 billion. So you divide that by four, you're essentially looking at $1.2 billion a quarter. They're still well short of that. Um, so that for me suggests that Airbnb has probably got more downside than upside. But what do I know? Um, you know, when, when I look at some of these IPOs, some of the valuations really don't they're thinking about in terms of their actually underlying fundamentals. So um, Airbnb will be very interested to see whether or not they meet expectations for Q2, Q3 and Q4 and what um, the board expectations are for a return to normal, whatever normal is. So that's Airbnb. And of course, we've got Disney. Now, Disney is looking fairly positive. Their theme parks opened this month. Um, that's not likely to be reflected in their numbers for Q2, but nonetheless, we've certainly seen a big uptick in terms of streaming and their streaming numbers. Um, so I think you know, it's going to be hard for, for Disney to sort of surprise the markets this quarter. They surprised the markets in Q1 with a surprise profit. Expectations are for a similar profit in Q2. How optimistic are they for Q2 and Q3? I would suggest that they can sustain this move higher because their theme parks are now reopening. The U.S. is coming out of um, it's coming out of a very long uh, winter hibernation, and you've got all of that spare cash sloshing around in terms of stimulus checks, 
which is likely to see a big rebound in theme park spending, which could augur well for further gains in the Disney share price um, when they release their second quarter numbers in on the 13th of May. So, summing up, the main focus I think for this week is likely to be on US retail sales and um, US CPI, as well as first quarter GDP numbers and manufacturing numbers from the UK economy. And, and obviously any, any spillover effects from today's US payrolls numbers were expecting a fairly decent number. So that's it for today and that's it for this week. Until the same time next week, thank you very much for listening. It's Michael Hewson talking to you from CMC Markets and thank you for listening.